Hello, welcome to our session uh, for this uh, class in urban studies um, in the Amsterdam and European cities MINOR uh, course. The theme today is, uh, I'm calling it, Think Global, Act Local. And the critical concepts that we'll be engaging with today include questions like, um, what has resource management and public health looked like, especially in terms of city design uh, throughout certain periods of history? What is germ theory? What are cholera? What was the concept of miasma? And how do these concepts relate to public health in urban areas specifically? How do people define what is considered waste? How is this culturally determined? And lastly, uh, a little bit of a quick look at what sustainable cities of the future might look like. Move to the next slide and um, you'll find out more. Okay, so we're beginning uh, with, well, Roman history. Let's start there um, for a number of reasons. Uh, we start with the Romans and we just sort of look quickly at the bullet points for that period of time, uh, that empire, uh, because, um, well, the Romans were famous for lots of things like their military prowess, uh, but they were also one of the first um, civilization societies to incorporate some f notion of public sanitation uh, and uh, the idea of public toilets, for example, bathhouses, and sewer systems were actually s sort of originated and f developed to a large extent by uh, the Roman emperors. Okay, so Rome had uh, legislation that stated that towns and cities, well, towns at that point, had to clear away waste from roads and that uh, waste material should be brought outside of town. Um, so you'd expect that this would improve the health of the people living in the um, Roman cities and towns. But actually recent research has showed um, that that wasn't necessarily the case. Evidence now shows that there were uh, prevalent uh, presences of parasites such as whip, whip worm, round worm, and uh, the parasite that causes dysentery that were just as prevalent under Roman rule as they these parasites were uh, previously. Um, there were also problems, uh, research has shown in ar archaeological research, that lice, fleas, and bed bugs, which are all issues currently plaguing uh, humankind in this day and age, uh, were also part and parcel of living under uh, Roman rule. Um, in fact, looking through, say, museum um, displays, especially in uh, Roman areas of, you know, pottery and things that were um, dug up archaeologically, lice uh, were evident in that one finds um, fine-toothed combs dating from the Roman era that were obviously lice combs. Um, what else can we say about Roman sanitation? Well, okay, uh, the Romans had public bathhouses and public toilets, uh, but these were, although at the time this was sort of groundbreaking, right, to sort of mass um, organize this human waste, that is, uh, it wasn't probably the cleanest uh, in terms of, you know, these were dirty places. There was excrement, there was urine, uh, the lighting was poor. Um, so although one could conclude that public bathhouses and toilets didn't have a negative effect on public health, um, saying that they led to some sort of positive outcome would be a stretch. Um, what else can we say? People had private toilets in their homes, uh, but these weren't connected to the sewers uh, because the upper classes feared um, what might come out of the sewer into one's own house. So for example, gases uh, and um, in some cases, fauna like rats. 
Um, what else can we say about, well, okay, and the Romans um, at that time in the notion of, let's say, well, what was considered medical, uh, that's a bit of a stretch, but there was this idea of what were called the four humors. Um, and again, you know, that there were four elements, uh, fire, water, earth, and air. And that these elements were also tied to four distinct uh, types of, let's say, humors or um, human behaviors. So we're at the point in history where there was absolutely no notion of the idea that uh, of, of contagion, for example, uh, and that sanitation and public sanitation is directly connected to stemming contagion. Um, move to the next slide and we'll go further uh, in talking a bit about the Romans. Okay, so we're talking um, more in detail now about uh, a certain iconic feature of what is considered, you know, the one of the greatest advances of the Roman Empire, and that is um, <clears throat> the development of, well, the distribution of probably the most vital resource uh, humankind has, and that's uh, water. So, okay. Uh, Roman civilization was predicated on this notion of uh, distribu distributing water as well as uh, sanitizing water. Um, this kind of technology wasn't you know, necessarily created by the Romans, but uh, had been in usage uh, on the island of Crete. So the Minoan uh, peoples had uh, used like rain harvesting and filtering systems in the, say, the middle of the third millennia. Um, and uh, yeah, so these kinds of, you know, notions that water management um, was part and parcel of uh, life uh, was indeed in existence prior to the Romans, but it was, uh, well, the, the Romans' uh, ability to organize that led to um, like the sophistication and like the, the wide reaching um, adoption of the Roman aqueduct uh, that you can see, one can see on landscapes you know, ranging from Spain to Syria. And again, these are iconic evidence of uh, well, Roman encroachment into far reaching territories, uh, but also Roman advancement. So aqueducts were public works, and uh, not every city had aqueducts. But for example, Pompeii uh, didn't have an aqueduct. They used wells, private cisterns uh, that were dug beneath houses. And some of these cisterns or wells were colossal. Um, however, other cities needed more water, for drinking water, for example. So. Um, aqueducts were an effective way of distributing water and keeping water clean for drinking. Um, why is this still sort of such groundbreaking uh, technology? Well, because aqueducts are still used. Uh, the technology has, of course, been improved upon in the modern day. Uh, but, you know, this notion um, of clean water and sharing clean water uh, still is endemic, is something that uh, is part of urban design and um, aqu agriculture uh, in the modern day. Okay, move to the next slide and we'll talk about um, <laughs> a different kind of water, uh, micturation, that is urine, uh, and its uses in keeping things clean. All right, welcome to this slide in which we will talk about um, why it was that the ancient Romans, among other peoples, 
uh, used urine to wash their clothes. Um, let's talk about urine, shall we? Micturation. Um, it wasn't just in ancient Rome. I mean, actually, uh, archaeological evidence has shown that uh, Viking um, civilizations uh, or Viking uh, peoples, um, and actually globally, right up until the 16th century, perhaps it's still being practiced, um, use urine, human urine, as a cleaning agent. Now, why is this? Well, chemically, urine is a quick and rich source of uh, urea, and this is a nitrogen-based organic compound that decays into um, ammonia. Now, as a base, ammonia in water acts as a useful cleaner because um, dirt and grease, which are slightly acidic, uh, are neutralized by ammonia. So, for example, in ancient Rome, uh, there were vessels, uh, which were commonplace on the street, for collecting urine. So passersby would pee into these vessels, and then the vats uh, full were taken to what was referred to as a philonica, or a laundry. Uh, the urine was diluted with water and then poured over a vat of dirty clothes. Uh, a worker would then stand in the tub, yes, that's right, in the pee, and stomp on the clothes, agitating uh, the fabric, much like a modern washing machine. Uh, urine was also really useful for uh, softening animal skin. So leather workers used it to remove hair uh, and to generally soften the, um, the, the, the skin to make it easier to work with. Um, so much so that even up to, let's say, the 1500s in England, uh, the, the textile industry regarded or used urine as a resource um, in order to um, produce and uh, work with textiles. What I think we see from this, I'm not trying to gross you out, but basically the, um, the notion of what is considered dirty or clean in a particular historic period or in a particular part of uh, the world is malleable. That is, the notion of what is dirty and clean is very sort of subjective and, and culturally determined, historically determined. So as we move through uh, the next slides, we'll see indeed that this becomes very important in our understanding of public sanitation and how cities keep people healthy. Uh, we'll move into the next slide in which we talk about the miasma theory of disease. Join me there, won't you? Okay, so we're talking about miasma theory, uh, which became, well, very popular and prevalent uh, up to the 19th century. So essentially the idea was that uh, diseases were thought to be caused by poisonous vapors uh, or mist in the air filled with particles mainly from decomposed or rotting matter. So for example, during the Black Plague, this is why doctors wore these very odd looking masks uh, that contained you know, herbs, spices, dried flowers, uh, vinegar. This was meant to be a sort of filter for uh, this miasmic uh, smell or odor. Again, that was thought to be the cause of disease. Um, the theory originated in the Middle Ages and endured for several centuries. And for example, the word malaria is actually named from the Italian mala is bad and aria is air. So this suspected origin of um, disease being in the air, right, in the smell. Now in 19th century England, uh, this miasma theory made a lot of sense to reformers, sanitary reformers. Uh, rapid industrialization and urbanization meant that you know suddenly you had this the growth of these ghettos, poor, filthy, and thus foul-smelling neighborhood city neighborhood areas, and these areas tended to be the the focal points of diseases and epidemics. 
Okay, so by improving housing and sanitation, and generally just cleaning up these areas, levels of disease fell. And so the observation or the, the thought was, oh, well, we got rid of the bad smells and the bad air, thus uh, people are healthier. But of course, while this was sort of the precursor to understanding um, germ theory, as we'll talk about in the next slide, moving away from the idea of poisonous vapors in the air and beginning to understand germs as microorganisms. Join me in the next slide, won't you? All right, uh, cheery, eh? <laughs> Welcome to What is Cholera? <clears throat> um, so we need to keep in mind what was happening in, um, well, Europe at the time, that cholera became uh, an epidemic. Um, it basically was, let's say, considered, uh, you know, first recognized as a uh, sort of terrifying epidemic in London in uh, the mid-1830s, 1831. Um, and this was the really a point at which the people of London and the um, government, uh, the governing bodies, began to feel a sense of urgency about the sanitation problems in this very densely populated um, urban area. But, okay, prior to, Great Britain was transforming into an industrialized nation. Um, and this started in like seven, the mid-1700s, uh, roughly, um, in which people were leaving the countryside moving en masse to urban areas like London uh, for, well, opportunity um, to make money in the newly built factories um, and in places like coal mines in the northern cities. So urban areas were becoming, again, very densely populated and rather dirty. By the 1800s, London was actually the largest city in the world. And... Um, you know, this mass migration led to social change, of course. So London, like many other cities at the time, was overwhelmed by the waste produced by this growing population. And the majority of these people lived in squalor, in these overcrowded slums. Um, human waste was piled up in courtyards. It overflowed from cesspits and basements. And there was no proper sewage system, so uh, human waste, fecal matter, poo, got into gutters and waterways. So and now we know, right, hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say. In these sorts of conditions, I mean, the spread of disease is inevitable. So at that point in time, there were outbreaks of diseases like typhoid, scarlet fever. Uh, but the arrival of this disease, cholera, um, really led to a sort of new kind of investigation into uh, causes of disease and how to sanitize. So at the time, doctors in Europe were not familiar with uh, symptoms of cholera in particular. They didn't know how the disease was spreading. They had no cure. And uh, there was a rapid onset of uh, symptoms uh, that led to, well, basically dehydration and loss of fluids and thus, uh, well, death. So the symptoms were so sort of quickly, uh, quick to, to come about, and they were so scary that, you know, this disease captured public imagination. And um, what did you see happening at the, well, not we, but I mean, the one, what did one see happening at this time in uh, these areas in, in uh, uh, urban areas. Well, you had this mass migration of foreigners in some cases, immigrants, right? And thus, the, and then you had this spread of disease. So to some degree, there was a, an idea that it was these foreigners who were bringing the disease. That cholera, for example, was a foreign epidemic. It was uh, actually commonly known as the Asiatic um, flu or Asiatic cholera invading the nation. Now let's talk further about um, well, we could talk a bit about, for example, how, okay, c pandemics in general and how do they um, relate to what we're seeing actually right now. Well, the first, you know, instances of uh, widespread pandemics were 
actually suffered, were brought to Rome by legionnaires returning from uh, the Middle East. And this was in um, 165 AD, you know, 200 AD, um, the Antonine Plague, it was referred to as then. There was the Black Death, right, um, in the mid 1300s, killing uh, 25 million people, one third of Europe's population. Then there was an influenza pandemic. Uh, this was in 1580. Just making the point that pandemics are uh, certainly nothing new to human history. Um, and then the cholera pandemic, as we've talked about in the 1800s. Uh, there was the Spanish flu in 1918. And um, now, okay, one could also cite uh, HIV AIDS in the 1970s as a pandemic, right? And now this le leads us up to the modern day and uh, what we're dealing with now. My point being that, indeed, pandemics uh, are nothing new. I think perhaps what's different now is that we're seeing this on a much more global scale. Now, why would that be? You know, these the disease is spreading rapidly across the globe because of the advent of um, cheap and available travel for all. Um, and so, you know, people migrate much greater distances than they ever have before in human history, thus leading to uh, the spread of disease, like proverbial wildfire. Ooh, let's keep talking about this. Uh, let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about the, the uh, advent of germ theory. Hello, and welcome to What is Germ Theory? Uh, okay, so in the previous slide, we talked about miasma and um, the theory that vapors and dirty air uh, or bad smells could lead to disease and sickness. <clears throat> well, germ theory was sort of a new idea that took hold and started to gain gradual acceptance in Europe and the United States from the middle 1800s on. And really, one of the sort of groundbreaking moments in acceptance of germ theory was the cholera uh, outbreak and epidemic. Um, thing is, though, germ theory was actually, it, it preceded uh, the cholera epidemic for 200 years. So basically, um, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, um, our Dutch contingent out there in listener land will recognize the name, uh, constructed his very first simple microscope in uh, the mid-1600s. And upon looking in at water, he saw these tiny organisms in the microscope. At the time, uh, von Leeuwenhoek didn't connect it with disease. But again, over the centuries, scientists observed, so for example, blood uh, from people who were suffering from disease and saw these microorganisms, and eventually scientific uh, theory began to lead the way toward, um, well, an epiphany, uh, a discovery of, oh, it's these microorganisms in the body that actually cause uh, disease and contagion. So this eventually superseded the miasma theory, for example, and this radically changed medical practice and indeed, why is this relevant today? Because it remains a guiding principle that still underlines contemporary biomedicine and medical uh, research. Let's move to the next slide and we'll talk about Jon Snow. No, not that Jon Snow. The other Jon, the first Jon Snow. <clears throat> All right, so we're up to the mid 1800s now. We've talked about miasma and the advent of germ theory. And now we need to talk about Dr. Jon Snow. Uh, not the Jon Snow of Game of Thrones, but um, a much more important figure, I would say, and far less fictional. Uh, Snow was studying an outbreak of cholera in London. He figured out, with uh, a good deal of detective work, 
um, basically mapping the outbreak of cases, I mean literally in a, in a physical map, he figured out that the source of the epidemic originated in a particular pump, a water pump on Broad Street. Um, what he concluded that was that, you know, over the course of, well, months uh, and, you know, long uh, study and, and investigation, it was not poisonous vapors or miasma that was, you know, the, the foul-smelling slum areas that was causing the spread of this uh, terrifying disease. It was actually the fact that um, there were poop, fecal matter, uh, in the water that was being uh, spread, uh, you know, through the city, actually, from this particular water pump. Um, I read a fascinating book about this that I recommend called The Ghost Map, the story of London's most terrifying epidemic and how it changed science, cities, and the modern world by Stephen Johnson. Um, indeed, this groundbreaking work that Snow and uh, working in tandem with a, a reverend, uh, Reverend Whitehead, uh, this groundbreaking work that they did really changed the, the very, well, picture of a city in that um, essentially what happened was, you know, they, they realized after watching, uh, seeing a woman, a mother, uh, dump a dirty diaper into a particular uh, area of the, the water, they then tracked the spread of the disease and again realized, oh, Okay, so it's actually poop in the water that's causing this, and this is because of germs in the poop that people are now ingesting. Um, as a result, sanitation became a, uh, an overriding concern, and uh, yeah, efforts were made then to sanitize cities. Um, what else can I say? Well... This, again, changed the very notion of uh, the spread of disease, especially in urban areas. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide in which we'll talk about, uh, well, the medical revolution and sanitation and Jacob Rees. Um, we're up to basically historically the period of the mid to late 18 hundreds. And as a result of the work of Snow and Reverend Whitehead and the advent and ex acceptance of germ theory, uh, cities were then embracing uh, improved sanitation practices. So what does this mean? Well, first and foremost, uh, better separation of drinking water from sewage outlets. Uh, people began to realize that you can't <clears throat> poop where you drink, right, uh, or eat. So again, we come back to that notion of um, the Romans. So long before, you know, that drinking water needs to be clean. And again, this is an absolutely crucial, uh, vital element of city living today and still remains a problem in many parts of the world. Uh, tiles began to be used in bathrooms instead of wood or carpet, again, because wood and carpet tend to uh, absorb bacteria. Tiles do not. This was the, well, the first time that, uh, you know, porcelain toilets indoors that could flush with clean water started to be um, seen in private homes uh, across the board. Rather than going out and um, relieving oneself into a hole uh, in an outhouse that many people use, the the middle class and the rise of the middle class. I mean, there were a lot of things at play here, but basically, uh, resources themselves, like porcelain and tile, were used, and clean water became available in households. The notion of ref food refrigeration uh, and having you know covering and refrigerating food so as not to allow for the growth of bacteria became. A thing, and keeping screens on windows to keep insects out also became quite important. I wanted to mention um, rather a, 
an important figure, certainly in uh, changing people's minds and bringing about some social reform and awareness in New York City in the late 1890s. Uh, his name was Jacob Rees, and uh, he was a Danish-American um, photographer, a Danish immigrant. He actually became a famous campaigner against slum housing, and he had a collected work of photography, a book called uh, The Other Half, and or How the Other Half Lives. And this really uh, just made clear to the middle and upper classes, upper classes particularly, uh, how dismal the conditions were for people living in slums. And I must also say that this also changed the notion of... Um, well, you know, those dirty foreigners, whether they were uh, my people, Italians, uh, the Irish, the Jews, uh, the Chinese, whoever the, the working poor immigrants, the working class in um, cities, and in this case, uh, you know, late 1800s, New York City, uh, the Lower East Side, it was incredibly densely populated. People were living in um, dismal tenement housing, as you can see in this photo, uh, you know, this sort of housing where you had, uh, and you also had these um, uh, very cheap five, seven cent, um, uh, basically boarding houses where people could sleep under a roof. Well, again, squalid, dismal, filthy, but it wasn't the people who were causing the problem. It was the notion that there was, you know, that the air was dirty. Okay, yes, but rather than blaming the people, Reese, through his uh, photojournalism, essentially, showed the upper classes, these people are people. Look how badly they're living. We need to do something about this. So uh, his photos and his, the publication of his books really kind of... Um, broke wide open the notion that, uh, you know, there should be social equality in urban areas and uh, people should be helped. So this led about reform in both city design and uh, class and social awareness. Click on the link on his name in the PowerPoint slide for a very interesting um, uh, audio excerpt you can listen to about him. And one of the questions I might leave you with with this slide as we move into more contemporary um, material in the next slides is uh, well whether photography can actually be um, a force for social good, right? Uh, that might be something we can talk about in terms of argumentation. Um, move to the next slide. Now the question becomes, uh, how do these concepts germ theory, sanitation, class equality, um, relate to public health in urban areas uh, nowadays? Well, despite the fact that urban living offers lots of opportunities in the way of jobs, services, uh, there are also concentrated health risks and hazards that people are exposed to in uh, urban populations. So whether they're low or high income, uh, there are, yeah, risks that people run. And um, some of the most prominent health disparities can be seen as a result of the uh, class or economic inequality in urban areas. This is very sort of stark in contrast. Um, urban dwellers live in overcrowded slums. So this lack proper sanitation, you know, the housing itself isn't healthy. Uh, ur urban housing may be poorly planned or, in fact, unplanned. Uh, transport, food systems, social and lifestyle factors are all contributing drivers in the epidemics of, not, of communicable and non-communicable diseases. Um, you know, that are linked to hazards like air pollution. So again, miasma, we've done away with the idea that smells can be bad, but certainly the notion of air being dirty is still a concern, right? People's diets may be poor in urban areas because they lack uh, access to fresh 
uh, foods. People may be more prone to physical inactivity, although one could argue that um, you know living in the suburbs necess necessitates driving, auto traffic that can lead to physical inactivity. Uh, but certainly, urban areas can also, whether you, you, traveling on public transport, can um, diminish the amount of walking done. Traffic in injuries and domestic injuries also po pose risks to people. Um, I've been reading some research. Um, I can share source material with you as we see each other uh, further into the future. But basically, one of the notions of a sustainable city of the future is um, higher usages of non-motorized public transport modes. Uh, so reducing auto traffic, you know, lowering the usage of private uh, cars and automobiles, this results in less air pollution. Streets are safer, right? So that leads to fewer traffic accidents. And planning communities for residents, as we saw in, for example, urbanized, um, planning cities for at a human scale rather than for uh, the movement of auto traffic. Uh, what else do we see in like sustainable cities of the future? Well, uh, that green areas are, that cities are designed so that uh, agriculture and access to fresh, clean air you know, is, is part of a city design. Um, the idea that uh, farming could be done underneath, now this is pretty mind-blowing, right? Underneath a city, uh, hydroponic, that is uh, water-based farms, could be growing crops under high efficiency uh, lighting. It's quite a futuristic idea. Uh, that buildings could be flexible, uh, that modular interiors can be swapped between buildings. So uh, neighborhoods are kind of, you know, it, it does away with the notion of good and bad neighborhoods in a city when you can move parts of buildings around. Uh, the notion of, and we'll get to this in the next slides when we begin to talk about what is waste and how do we define what garbage is. Well, recycling and reusing uh, is part of the city of the future, right? Using items, those that aren't biodegradable items that don't break down in the, in the open air, uh, like plastic, have to be used and reused, recycled in uh, dense populations. Uh, we'll talk about this further when we have our classes on uh, diversity and inclusion in urban areas. But the idea that <clears throat> um, cities should be designed to be accessible to all. So this is part of a sustainable city of the future. Everyone can get round and live comfortably. That there is room to breathe. Um, making more use of solar uh, energy, for example, solar walls and windows, solar panels, that, that streets are green. Um, I'll include, include a link uh, to a very interesting National Geographic um, magazine issue on uh, cities of the future. But what we've seen here are some of the watchwords of the cities of the future. Let's move on to talking about, when we talk about cities and we talk about waste and cleanliness, well, we have to make sure we define that these terms are uh, culturally disparate. They're defined differently in different parts of the world. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to deviate just a bit in this slide. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about um, highfalutin theoretical concepts, uh, but just to, well, pre present a few anecdotes from my own life experience uh, that helped me to see, oh, we don't all look at our world and see things as dirty or as clean or as uh, garbage or not. Uh, as the saying goes, one person's trash is another person's treasure. Uh, when I was living in Central Asia, I could not help but notice, because it was a part of daily living, that the people I lived with in Kyrgyzstan used and reused everything. Uh, very little was thrown away. 
So for example, plastic bottles, which uh, we purchase on a daily basis, actually, and then throw away. <laughs> I mean, plastic packaging uh, is just over the top in this part of the world, in the Netherlands, in Northern Europe, the developed and industrialized countries. Plastic packaging is a, a huge problem. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, people reused everything, so Ziploc bags, if they could get them, were rewashed, dried, and reused. Uh, Coca-Cola bottles were then used to store olive oil, uh, wine, what have you. My point being that, um, again, what we consider waste is very, very specific to the context we live in. Research has actually been done, um, and uh, I read one research report on the uh, Elsevier um, site in which uh, a survey was conducted amongst uh, university students. They had a, a research pool of 400 students in Japan, Germany, and uh, Israel. And what the results of the research showed is that there were very different notions of uh, household waste management and recycling. So uh, in the German student households, there was a lot more awareness of and practicing of recycling, uh, whereas this was much lower in uh, Japan and then in Israel as well. So, um, well, what the study concludes and I would say this from my own anecdotal experience, uh, before people and governing bodies dictate uh, waste management policies, cultural considerations need to be taken into account. Uh, you know, as we saw with the notion of urine, <laughs> Well, what's considered dirty, what's clean, what you throw away, what you absolutely do not use, uh, is very specific to context. Um, in parts of Africa, in agricultural areas, uh, dung, fecal matter, is, is an absolute resource for, uh, for gardening. And uh, you know, compost and manure are viable um, resources for uh, gardening material. So again, part of what I'm trying to do here is help you to raise your own awareness as to what do I see as garbage and is my trash someone else's treasure? Move to the final um, picture slide and we'll start to wrap up. All right, there's one more uh, slide after this as to why have we been looking at all of these concepts and what does this mean for your own um, learning? Well, the last slide, what makes a sustainable city? We've talked about this to some degree uh, previously. Um, by the, it's projected that by 2050, the world's population will reach almost 10 billion, and nearly 70% of this booming population, so that's you know 6.5, almost 7 billion people, are projected to live in urban areas. Um, research was done in looking at urban planning and architectural um, experts, and uh, you know, how would they design a city of the future, looking at lessons of the past, that is what we learned from epidemics and outbreaks like that of cholera. Um, and how would we anticipate well, the challenges of the future, which are very much appropriate um, to, for consideration at this time period because, um, well, we're living in a global pandemic at the moment. So what sort of challenges are we facing? And perhaps I might put, put this forward. Uh, the very means by which I'm reaching out to you and sharing my ideas are predicated on the notion that uh, I have access to uh, internet, right? I have um, a laptop. 
I have the, the material resources to communicate with you. Um, in designing cities of the future, I imagine one thing we'll see from the coronavirus pandemic is a heightened awareness of uh, who has access to uh, communication in this digital age and who doesn't. So much like we saw with Jon Snow and cholera, who had access to clean water and how did that affect um, the, the health and um, successful outcome of their life? In this day and age, I might say that it's uh, access to the internet. Um, okay, so if we look to the past, the present, the future, basically there were 10 precepts or key principles that um, architectural and urban planning design experts came up with. And these key principles are, and I'll just leave you with these 10, the notion of ecology, water, energy, livability, waste, food, mobility, multiculture, infrastructure, and economy. If you're interested, um, Search from mega regions to micro-size homes, cities of the future. Again, it was a, a, specific, a particular issue of National Geographic. We'll move to our final slide and um, talk about what this means for you. All right, welcome to the final slide. Um, what we're here to now sort of figure out in, in concluding is uh, what the challenge is for you as a student in thinking carefully about what we've discussed. And you need to decide for yourself, um, given what you now know about ethos, pathos, and logos, because you worked through the other PowerPoint, what sorts of questions could you ask yourself regarding the theme of um, urban health, right? Acting locally, thinking globally, pandemics, epidemics, class inequality. Think about the theme in terms of possible topics for argumentation. And then what sorts of claims or statements could you make to stimulate critical informed discussion on this topic? Given what you now know about finding reputable and credible source material, why? Because you worked through the previous PowerPoint. Um, where do you plan to begin searching for outside source material, and what sorts of search terms will you use? Again, the goal of this module, this course, is um, to make an informed argument about one of the issues, one of the themes that we deal with in the coming weeks. And uh, in doing so, to, well, raise awareness and stimulate critical thinking and questioning about the world around us. Okay, so next week we'll, we'll talk more in depth about uh, what an argumentative thesis or stance is. And um, we'll talk about the theme, which is um, naming. Take a look at our module guide online. Uh, but again, think about ethos, pathos, logos. We have to use logos. So in order to create a sub substantive, a solid argument, you need to use research, statistics, um, evidence. But how could you use an appeal to authority, ethos, or an appeal to emotion, pathos as a means of um, making a strong argument. Your homework, of course, is to go out there. Uh, don't go out. Don't go out. <laughs> to go online and look for reputable, credible source material. Uh, start searching to find out more information about this topic. Um, and feel free to ask any questions if you have them. Bye for now.